live. Awesome. What up, guys? Welcome to the live. I got Arlen back here today. Yesterday, we had a bit of technical difficulties, but today we're going to actually kick ass. Now, the whole point of this live today is to genuinely show you how to be resourceful. There are so many things that can happen in your life that will completely throw you off. Like I woke up this morning, my Instagram got deleted. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of thousands, maybe even a million dollars worth of money uh, for editing, for ads, just, just to market this thing. And nuked, gone like that overnight, right? And how many clients did I have there? How many leads did I have there? A bunch of stuff. Well, you got to pivot. You got to learn. You got to keep going. My whole team's asking me, how are you in such a good mood? Because it is what it is, right? At the end of the day, it is what it is. So I'm going to show you how to have that ability to pivot. I want to give you complete emotional intelligence. And Arlen and I are going to get pretty vulnerable today. We're going to show you how to actually go to the next level. I, I think today is going to be the day where I get you a breakthrough that is so significant. And Arlen also assists me here. We're going to do it together. We're going to get you such a powerful breakthrough that you're not going to be able to not go to the next level. You will try to stay where you're at. And at the end of this live, you're not going to be able to. There's no way... You're not going to push yourself after this live. There's no way you're not going to hit that next income level. You're not going to go to the gym. You're not going to be healthy. You're not going to go date with someone. You're not, you're not going to stay where you're at. That is my promise to you at the end of this live. That is a bold claim, but I can tell you now that what I'm going to give you here, what Arlen's going to give you is going to transform your fucking life. It's going to be entertaining. It's going to be engaging, and it's going to be transformational. So without further ado, Arlen, you want to introduce yourself to everyone? Of course. Hey, what's up, everybody? Marcel's channel. My name is Arlen Moore. I, uh, I'm just a, I'm just a fruity little travel hoe that's just, uh, hanging out with this handsome guy <laughs> and, uh, I'm excited to, excited to talk. And by the way, I just want to, I want to quickly check, um, how is everybody hearing us? Is the audio good today? Is everything, you know, smooth? Yeah. Jack, how's the chat? Jack says uh, good. Yeah, it's good. I love, I love part coming in. All right. Nice. Great. Well, welcome. Yeah. We see 25 people on here again. For those of you just joining, welcome. My promise to you today is I will help you change to the point where you're not going to be able not to. So the first thing I want to bring up is I want to show you a common theme amongst every single human being who is extremely confident, someone who believes in themselves. This is the number one thing in all success. I will say it time and time again. There is nothing more important than self-belief. Now, self-belief is difficult if you grew up in an environment where everyone around you doubts you. And they are so confident that it is hard to win, that the world is against them. It is us against the world. The world is out to get me. People don't like me. They're racist. They're, they're not supportive. I grew up in a poor country. Whatever the belief is, these are limiting beliefs and they're holding you back. I want to show you how to eradicate these beliefs today so we can actually go to the next level. Now, all right, let me ask you this. When you first started your career, right, what do you think? Was, was there a moment, I had a moment like this, almost everyone I've ever interviewed has a moment like this. Was there a moment where you said, oh shit, I have been limiting myself? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I spent a very long time trying to rewire my mind because I had so many essentially poor people beliefs programmed into my brain just from, I don't even want to say my parents, just like you grow up and it's your entire community. You know, if you don't, if you don't grow up around people who are multimillionaires, let, I mean, let alone your parents, right? I think there were maybe like, as I was a kid growing up, there were maybe a few people that I knew that were like multimillionaires. And I met them as a caddy at a golf course. And I could tell there was something different about them. You know what the biggest difference was? It was overall optimism and just excitement about life in general. That was like the, that was the single thing that I noticed. And then the, the crazy generosity. Because like, to me at the time, uh, I was a, I was a caddy. Uh, before that, I was a busboy, right? So I was earning six dollars an hour as a busboy, and then I, I was a caddy at a very fancy golf course. And I was, I was lucky if I made a hundred dollars a day, right? Wake up at four in the morning, get to the golf club. You don't even know if you're going to get out. Um, and in the back of my head, I'm like, well, at least I'm around rich people, right? At least I'm going to learn something from just being in that energy, and. I remember the, the, the guy, uh, actually, I see him around my town all the time. His name is Mr. Callahan. He tipped me like $300. And it was- $300 at the time. Yeah, at the time, that was huge for me, right? It's still pretty big. But um, th the point is, like, I had to do so much work because aside from Mr. Callahan, pretty much everyone I knew around me, my, my parents, my friends' parents, obviously the kids I grew up around, nobody had an abundance mindset when it came to money. And so I have put in- I can't even describe how much work into rewiring my mind so that I can think like a rich person. So 
Let me, let me bring something up to everyone watching this because I think what you're saying is, is crucial. I remember I was working valet mm-hmm. and I'm doing an after Grammys party or after Oscar party. I don't remember which one it was. And I'm at this crazy mansion off sunset towards Palisades, close to where you live actually. And I'm working valet and Kourtney Kardashian gets out of her car. You know, Adam Sandler was there. Ice Cube was there. I remember I scratched Adam Sandler's Hellcat. He had a brand new Hellcat with seven miles on it. He literally drove it from the dealership to this, to this thing. And I'm coming off the driveway and I'm, I'm just hearing go, you know, like I obviously didn't know what I was doing. And then I remember Ice Cube's Rolls Royce. I get in it. I'm driving it. And as I'm there, all the guys around me are looking at these people who are rich, famous, and they're just talking shit. The whole time, like, who the fuck do they think they are? Look at how, look how snobby they are. Look at how ignorant they are. And they really weren't. They were really nice people, a lot of them. Now, the broke people were actually snobby. The, the ones who were just trying to, like, just somehow got in there, those ones were the snobby ones. But the famous ones weren't. And I remember thinking how different my thought process was than theirs. Now, here I am eight years later, almost, and I've, I'm the guy driving those cars. I'm mm-hmm. the guy who doesn't even let the valet drive the car, right? And I just see the difference in mentality. And most of these guys that I've seen are still in the same valet company. They're still right now parking on the people's cars. And the difference really is, is that they're in a mentality that's negative. They're focused on what's wrong. They're not appreciative. They're not grateful. They don't see opportunity. And I think a lot of people have a negative pattern of focus. I mean, it's so easy to find what's wrong. It's so easy. Mm. People are so resourceful of being unresourceful. They're so good at finding why they can't do it. I ask you, hey, why don't you make more money? Because A, B, C, D, why can you make more money? How many times have you thought about that? How many times have you given yourself a reason for how to go to the next level? So I want to actually give you and everyone a tool now that they can use that will allow them to go to the next level. And I think this tool you'll leverage in every area of your life. So imagine now you have a business and you hit a million dollars a year or $2 million a year, whatever. And now you're plateaued. There's something stagnant going on. Something that I'd like to bring up to you is if you don't innovate, if you don't change, if you're not constantly ahead of the game, eventually all businesses will go out of business. There are massive businesses that were worth billions of dollars, the biggest companies in the world. Now they're out of business. You know, uh, a really good one, for example, would be Fry's or Sears, right? Sears was the biggest uh, of its class and it's out of business. So you look at these massive companies that are going into bankruptcy, it's because they didn't innovate. They didn't do things to keep the needle moving forward. So let's say you're stuck. You're stuck because you're doing the same thing. You got into an unconscious pattern where you stopped innovating and you're like, oh, this works. It's not just about doing what works. It's about finding new things that work. And that's what sets the great from the average apart. You might say it's not average to make a million a year, but amongst those entrepreneurs who are successful, if you have a successful business, that's below average, to be honest. It really is below average. So if you want to talk about someone who's always ahead of the game, who's always successful, you got to be in in the mentality of how do I innovate? How do I do something new? Now I'll say you do something so brilliant that no one else does. You are constantly fucking innovating to the point where you say, I'm a dumb travel hoe. You know, I'm a doctor. Like, like you're doing things to where I don't know if I'm entertained or I want to spend money with you. But, you know, Arlen was showing me his engagement. His engagement is almost 30%. 30% of his following watches his stories, his Instagram stories. Now I've dated Victoria's Secret models, celebrities I've hung out with. They've showed me what they get on their views. Not a single human being I've ever met in my entire life gets the engagement you get ever. You, you, You say, hey, send me a DM. In 30 seconds, you have 300 DMs. Now, I'll get that at a seminar or an event with 2,000 people in the room. I have never gotten that off of my Instagram. Now, I've gotten a lot of DMs from Instagram, but never on the level that you have. And I've never seen anyone get on the level you have. Like people actually look at my Instagram and they go, wow, well, what was my Instagram? Uh, and they go, wow, your engagement's crazy. But you, on the other hand, you, know, you, just, you just keep people on the edge of your seat. So what is it that allows you to innovate? Like when you think about things, what do you spend your day doing? Like what, what does your day look like? Not just in your actions, but your routine mentally. What's your mental routine? Yeah, so I, I think my uh, we turn it down the fire. One hundred percent. Get a little too hot, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Are you sweating? We're turning up the heat, yeah. so we don't need the fire anymore. Yeah. Um, I um, I I think it comes a lot from my upbringing. I I mean I, my both my parents are artists. My dad's a, a photographer, and not only is he a photographer, like when people think photographer, they think they, they think like portrait photographer or like you know, still life or something. My dad is taking the strangest pictures you could possibly imagine. Like he, he just was, uh, on a little kind of beach vacation with my mom and he posted some photos on his Instagram of this guy in this guy, literally in a thong, like this just dude 
not like just like a kind of regular chunky looking dude in a thong. And then like the juxtaposition, the next post was a beautiful flamingo. So like he, he's like playing with this disgusting sort of image and then like, you know, the most beautiful nature. It looks great. Uh, the, the most beautiful nature, um, you know, that you can imagine. My mom is an abstract painter. You know, she's a, she, she right. She, she, paints with oil and she's an art professor so when you wake and, up in the morning yeah what is what is your routine you get up and you say okay hey what how, how do you come up with these things like you say you're a dumb travel hall. i remember i attended a webinar you had and you're like i'm a doctor that fucks yeah, yeah, yeah. now obviously you're not a doctor you know but that was your pitch for a bit and you were making hundreds of thousands of dollars every month saying dm me if you want to fuck yeah, yeah so explain how that well, works how does yeah, that work no, i mean it's it's like okay so again like i came from this background of like not only is my dad a photographer, he photographs weird stuff, and he's he's also dyslexic. So everything's backwards for him. So it's very easy for him to be creative because he's always doing everything wrong or backwards. So that's the environment I grew up in. And I think I think what it is for me is like I just don't like doing what everyone else is doing. So I my mentality when I wake up is okay, you know, I I can I'm gonna make a piece of content today. I see what everyone else is doing, and I'm like, I don't wanna do any of that. Okay, so that's that's like that's kind of like the pre-frame. The next thing is like, okay, so how do you how do you actually innovate? Because th that's like the reason why I want to innovate. But uh, the the mentality when it comes to like, okay, how do I create something original? Is is basically free flow, free flow and association. When I was uh, building my audience, I was making YouTube videos in college, and I was making videos every single day. I would wake up. I would film whatever my life was doing, whatever I was doing that day. That's what I filmed. I would try to like interject and add stories and such here and there. But then ultimately the storytelling took place in the editing process. And I would sit down to edit and I would edit for like six hours straight. Often when I was editing, I would hit the flow state. So if you ever hear like, you know, a jazz pianist in a, in a jazz bar or okay. like a, a, you know, a, yeah. any sort of instrument. Yeah, they just, plays they just instrument. get into the zone. They just get into the zone and they might actually fuck up or do something they've never done before. But the, the, the true and most real and the best innovation happens from flow state. The travel ho thing, uh, I can't take full credit from it for that at all. Uh, there's a guy named Nick Cosman who I was with in New York City. And uh, you know, he's an entrepreneur who's made tens of millions of dollars. Um, and we were just out at dinner and the travel ho thing came from just, it was a joke. It was just like, it, it, one of our friends was like, so what do you actually do for work? And my friend Nick was like, just a dumbass travel ho. And like, it, it's, so, it was just so do funny. You, do you think that anyone watching here should become a dumbass travel ho and click the link in the description and sign up for our seminar next week in Los Angeles? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So let me tell you guys what's going to happen to the seminar really briefly, uh, because that's what's sponsoring this podcast. So welcome to the sponsor, the free sponsor. Yeah. The free sponsor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the free sponsor for this podcast is actually my event next week. It's on Thursday, January 25th in Los Angeles. Now it's going to be at the universal Sheraton. Uh, you know, I got extreme security. Everyone there is a Navy seal. You know, they've done like 12 tours. Some of them <laughs> they are fucking sick and, uh, it's going to be awesome. We have over 700 signups. If you click the link in the description, if you're not already coming to this event, you absolutely should fly in for it. I don't care where you're at, fly in. I'm gonna change your life. I'm gonna give more value at that event than I've ever given in my life. Now, here's the difference between an event in person versus a podcast. This is a very chill environment. I'm not in the same mindset or the same state I am on stage. When I'm on stage, you will feel the electricity in your veins. You will think that I have a mic on and that the speakers are on. And even if they're not on, I will still project like, like a wind turbine. My voice will go to the back of the room and put chills in your spine. And by the time you're out, because I've literally been hypnotizing you the entire event, your brain will not allow you to ever go back to how you were. You will try your best to fail at that point. You will try your best to not be able to do what you want. You'll try your best to go back into that. I'm going to sleep in. And something in your head will take you out of the bed, smack you, and put you onto the best routine you've ever been in your life. This isn't 2024, hey, I have a New Year's resolution. This is 2024, I went to Marcel's event and Arlen's event, and I am going to walk away a different human being. I am making a deal. By coming to that event, here's how you're gonna keep your end of the deal, and here's how I'm gonna keep my end of the deal. You show up, that's your end of the deal. You find a way to come no matter what. My end of the deal is you're gonna leave that event not having the same mentality 
you will never ever think about life the same way. I will shatter every normal way of thinking you've ever had in your whole life. And if you really like the event and we have a few tickets left and you want to join Limitless for the rest of the weekend, which is on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's a paid event. Well, you're welcome to join. So just wanted to quickly say that. Now, back to what you were saying. I think there's something interesting that most people miss out on. And it's the idea that human beings get bored. The average attention span in the early 1900s was 54 minutes long. Back then, you get your newspaper and you would spend about 54 minutes going through it, reading the news in the world and getting up to date on things. Today, you're on Instagram and every other reel, every other TikTok is someone getting their head chopped off or you know, someone getting a car accident, falling off a mountain skiing, beautiful people, the prettiest people you've ever seen in the world, the nicest cars, the craziest luxuries, things you don't even know exist until you just get jaded to it. You're like, wow. And now our attention spans at seven seconds. That's of 2019. We're in 2024. It's probably even shorter now, unfortunately. And you want to stand out. You want to stand out from the guy next to you that's a multi-billionaire posting content on Instagram. How are you going to stand out? I'll tell you how you're going to stand out. There is something unique about people on YouTube versus Instagram. There's something unique about an audience that's watching long form content, longer content than short content. Here is what it is. Your brain is actually wired differently than someone who's just a stimulus responder. The beauty in your ability to stay and focus and lock into this live right now and not leave and just pay attention. The beauty in that is that there is a part of your brain that actually has the ability to focus on what you want long enough until you achieve it. Most of the time, people cannot even attend a live that will change their life. My promise to you, even on this live, is that I will rewire your brain before the end of it. And most people will join this and go and leave. And I invite those people to leave. But those of you that truly want to change your life, I'm sitting here by this fire pit that's off and still burning hot with Arlen in the heat, skipping out. We got invited to go. It's Friday night. We got invited to go out. We We had the sickest offer tonight. We said no. We want to change your life. So I just want you to know that we are here. We're dedicating this time to you. Now I want to kind of switch the topic up coming back into this podcast moment. And I want to briefly talk about what was the lowest low of your life and how long ago was it? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, the lowest low in my life I would have to say was probably in high school. Um, and it's, it was low because it was, it was energetically low, meaning, I, w- I wasn't even aware. I hadn't awoken to my own existence on planet Earth yet. Like I was stuck in my mind. I think the biggest prison everyone has is their mind. We started off talking about limiting beliefs, but the most compelling, um, the, the most uh, restrictive place to be is stuck in your own head. And that's where I was. I, I woke up every single day driving to school and every thought of my brain was negative. It was just, why don't you drive into that tree? You know, oh, oh really? that person probably doesn't yeah, like, like you. suicidal thoughts. Like that. Suic- it was it was a strange type of suicidal thought, though, because I don't I, I wouldn't say I was like clinically suicidal. I just had suicidal thoughts. I know that sounds weird, but it's like they were repetitive and obsessive and compulsive. And it would it, you know, there were great moments in high school. I had great friends. I had actually my life on the outside was solid. You know, I, I had I was captain so, of sports teams. So but my mind was just a prison. And I couldn't get out. And what do you feel you got that from? Like, do you feel that that was learned? To be honest, I really think it was, um, I, I think it was a part of the awakening process. You know, I, I believe that, you know, when we grow, we need to experience pain. You know, you look at a, a, a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. The process is disgusting. It's like getting all demented, going into a cocoon, and then it breaks out and becomes this beautiful thing. That's how I view like it, the density of my consciousness was just, it was very stuck and I could not get out. And, and it's a hard place to be, you know, I, 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 uh, I actually still believe that a large part of my motivation to even do stuff like this is to help that younger version of myself out there, you know, like, cause I know there's people watching this right now that are in that place that I was, you know, maybe not fit. I think it happened to me relatively early. I, I broke out at like 18. But there's people out there whose every thought in their mind is negative. They have zero control over their mind. And um, that's uh, that, that was by far the darkest moment of my life. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I would say for me, the, the darkest moments in my life were – he's going to stream it on there. That's why, oh, I, got yeah, yeah, okay. that's why I turned it on. <laughs> um, anyways. I'm so, like, Jack, you just – 
Turn. Watching TV yeah, during the stream. Like <laughs> no, I told him to turn it on so okay. he can watch gotcha. everyone's reactions and kind of answer. Oh, them. that'd be dope. Yeah. yeah, I just want to see what people say. That way we're more <sighs> interactive with you guys. But uh, I think there were a few dark moments. Okay. The, the first dark moment was seeing my parents' reaction. I, I remember this moment specifically. I'm like 11, no, nah, I'm like 12 or 13 years old. And I'm in the car with my sister. I have a twin sister. My parents picked this up. My dad's driving and my mom's in the passenger seat. And this is around the time where we started to lose everything, right? All our money and everything like that. And I'm looking, I'm in the left side. I'm looking at the rear view mirror. I could see my dad's face, his eyes, and I could see my mom. And I asked them to get us McDonald's. So we wanted McDonald's. And they said no. And my dad responded like kind of angry. He's like, no, stop asking. You know, because I guess he didn't know how to, how to say no to me and it bothered him. And I understood, like at 12, I, I understood what, what he meant. Yeah. And... Jack, switch angles, bro. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> oh, we can see everybody now. That's cool. Yeah, you can see everybody. It's cool. Anyways, um, and I just remember him saying no. And my mom also said, you know, it's okay. I'll, I'll make you something at home. And I remember that was the moment where we were like, we, okay, hey, like my parents don't have money. And I didn't know what money was up until that moment. And then the second thing that kind of fucked with me was the first few times I got heartbroken. Yeah. You know, I remember getting heartbroken. I'm like, why, why is that happening to me? Like, yeah. that's not, I've never experienced this feeling before. Like not getting someone I, I, I really liked and I wanted, I, I just didn't understand it. And then I remember just kind of losing, starting to lose things like losing my dog uh, and then losing two dogs in the same day, two months later, you know, struggling like the entrepreneurship struggle. Like, I think those are the, like, that's the growth of, of the suffering. And I think now it's not that my life is any easier. I actually believe that my life is much more difficult now. If I'm not making anywhere from thirteen to fourteen thousand dollars a day, I'm out of business. And I think that pressure that's there twenty four seven is extreme, right? Mm -hmm. it, it it actually is pretty extreme. And I've learned to deal with stress, kind of like a muscle. I think Tony Robbins talks about it. He talks about this as like an emotional muscle. You know, if you go to the gym and you lift weights, your muscles get bigger. I think your ability to handle stress also gets bigger. And my ability to handle stress has improved only because I've gone through so much challenge so many challenges in my life and for those of you watching this you might be going through something right now in any area whether it's your relationships your friendships your health uh, your business that is tough and it's a hard time and you feel stuck you feel lost don't know what's going to happen i can tell you that it always gets better maybe not today maybe not tomorrow but it will always get better. And if you just know that deep in your heart that it will get better and you don't give up, because if you give up, then there's nothing anyone can do. As long as you never give up, your dreams will come true. I always say, the only difference between you actually achieving your dream and not is whether or not you gave up on your dream. And if you gave up on your dream, you're never gonna accomplish your dreams. And if you didn't, well, eventually I would place everything I would all my bets that it's going to happen. And I think a lot of people just give up on themselves early. You know, I mean, you didn't give up, right? Even though you've been through a lot of crazy shit. I've been through a lot of crazy shit. And I would say the, the biggest challenge I see people have is that when times get really hard, they let their brain give up for them. You didn't make the decision. A part of you that you learned from your mom, your dad, your teachers, something, a friend, someone said something to you, you're not going to make it. There was a moment where that got through to you and you believed it. And that, that suggestion, mm. that thing that someone told you, the hypnotic suggestion, right, mm -hmm. became a belief. Mm -hmm. And that moment that your belief shifted from, I know I'm going to make it happen, to I know I'm not going to make it happen, or they're right, I'm not going to do it. That moment where everything shifts, well, that's what's going to happen. There's about to be an ad, guys. I uh, Well, skip the ad. How do we skip that? <laughs> oh, my God. Are we, are we getting ads? Ads inserted. Oh no! Oh my fucking god! That's whack. Uh, are we are we getting ads? Can the can the chat tell us if we're getting ads or not? That's it. All right. We good. We're back. Yeah. I don't know how this works, but if we got okay. ads, that's kind of whack. Yeah. No. I I have a question for you, Marcel. Um. I mean, bro, we could we could be on this podcast for a very long time. Um. But one of the questions I have for you because it's something you've said to me. And uh, I, I want to ask, this is going to be, oh man, there's so much. Okay. So you talk about like, you talk about being suggestible, you know, like you, you talk about, you've said to me like Arling, you're very suggestible. And what you were just talking about 
when someone tells you a negative belief, right? If, if you are too suggestible, you might believe that negative belief about yourself and it stops you from growing. Yes. But on the other hand, right, being, uh, have, have, or being suggestible is a positive. So can you just talk about like, when is it good to be suggestible? When is it bad to be suggestible? And how can you actually be aware enough to control and open yourself to being suggestible versus uh, like, then how keenly aware of you, are you of that on a daily basis? It took me years, even now, there are moments where I'll catch myself slipping, right? And when I catch myself slipping into a moment where I'm talking to somebody and that somebody is negative, or I'm, let's say you're mm. close to someone, the closer you are to someone, the more suggestible you are to them. So your parents, that's why oftentimes our parents have the biggest influence on us. You'll have a goal and you'll, you'll think so big. You're like, I want to accomplish this thing. And your parents will look at you and tell you, I don't, I don't think you're doing a good thing. Go to yeah. college, give up on your dreams. And you're doing this to help them out. And they're actually influencing you and hurting you mentally. They're, they're fucking with your feelings. They're making you doubt yourself. I think it's the people who are closest to us that we have to choose and be the most selective with. And it's hard, it's hard to do that. It's hard to be like, yo, my spouse is fucking me over. My siblings are fucking me over. My parents are fucking me over. My best friends are doubting me. My closest childhood friends are doubting me. But suggestibility, you know, how open you are to changing your belief really depends on how much you respect someone and how close you are to someone. And if you're constantly getting triggered by people around you, then either you need to develop the skills to overcome the insecurities that they're triggering. Because if you're fat and I tell you, hey, you're fat, it'll trigger you. Some of you might have gotten triggered by that. Or if I tell you you're stupid and that triggers you because you feel like you're stupid or you were stupid at one point, it'll trigger you. We're most suggestible to the things we believe and to the people that we're closest to. If you can say, hey, what are the best beliefs I need in order to accomplish the things I want, you're going to become less suggestible. And you have to choose whether or not you're more confident in the belief that you're going to make it or you're more confident that other people could sway you. I am so sure of what I know that it doesn't matter what other people tell me. I don't care. But there, there's a border of, of having that skepticism be too high to where now you're broke. Most broke people are extremely skeptical. They're not skeptical mm -hmm. of being broke. They're not skeptical <laughs> that everything is a scam. They're not skeptical that everything's not possible. They're skeptical that it's possible to be more. So really based on what you believe, if I believe that, you know, the Messiah is coming back, the Jesus is the Messiah, right? Then anything that I see that might imply Christianity, I'll be suggestible to. And even that implies that, hey, if I'm super rich and money should be in my life, mm -hmm. I'm going to be super suggestible to anything that, any opportunity. You know, if I've been scammed before, I might be, I might look for things in that situation that show me that the person's not good mm -hmm. versus them being good. So if you catch yourself in a pattern where you're believing too many people and you're falling for the wrong things, you should kind of check yourself at the beginning until you can get to know someone and trust someone and trust yourself. But eventually you get to a point where you're so sure of your own thoughts and you're so sure of everything that you know. You're like, this is it. But you have to be open-minded. I'm always changing what I know. I'm so willing to change. But you have to get to a point where you're not allowing those around you to get you to give up on your dreams. And I think those who believe in the dream enough won't be suggestible to anything other than that belief. Mm. Yeah, so I guess what you're saying then is that what, what, what you're saying is it's good to be suggestible. It, it sounds like what you're saying is it's simple. I mean, it's, it's good to be suggestible when there's a belief that is, is positive for your life. And it's bad to be suggestible when there's a belief that limits you. And some That's people it. don't know how to decipher between the two. Right. And, okay. and sometimes you'll actually, I've had this happen where people are so negative that for the first time in their life, they'll be around me and they'll feel happier than they've ever been. And then before you know it, they leave, they leave and they, they're like, whoa, why was I so happy? That's wrong. I shouldn't be that happy. Like my life doesn't, I don't deserve this happiness. Mm -hmm. And it's because the unfamiliarity of those emotions is is actually quite negative. So I believe that the number one thing people need to do is identify successful people in their life that they want to be like, because most people are, they have bad models. A lot of people have bad models and you need to model their mindset, model what they do, model how they think. And that'll really benefit you. And most of the time it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to find someone like that, which is why you should come to an event like the seminar, because mm. you're going to find people who are like you, who want to improve, who want to get better. Even if they're going through some crazy shit, you're going to be around the right people. I mean, we have 
like I said, 700 something signups. I mean, <laughs> that's a lot. It's going to be crazy. That's a crazy event. I have friends who promote seminars for months and they don't get that. We got that in a week. So that's nuts. Very excited. Yeah. What uh, are you most excited for with the event? I'm most excited for the fact that there's going to be a lot of people there at the same time. The energy is going to be nuts. And I, the more people that are in an event, the better I do. So the more souls that I'm seeing in front of me, the more stimulation I have, the more my talent actually comes out. Mm -hmm. I actually think I'm the best in the world at this. I'm the best in the world at changing lives. And for that version of me to appear, I just need to connect with the room. And I think this room is going to be nuts. What are some ways that you can make suggestions to yourself? Like you say this, I, this is the first thing that I knew about you. You said that you were, uh, you're the best hypnotist in the world, the best success coach in the world. That was one of the first things that I, I knew about you because you, you, you basically advertised it. And when you said that, I was like, huh? Like, okay. So a little background on that before I hear your answer. I had a friend, uh, my friend, Tony pillow. I don't know if I ever introduced you to Tony. He's an extremely talented videographer. And I knew him when he literally sucked. Like I met him in Boston. He was, he reached out to me. He was actually, I posted my second YouTube video in Boston. I had zero subscribers. He reached out to me. He was like, Hey, I saw your video. I don't know how he saw it, but he somehow found it. He was like, I do camera stuff. Let's hang out. And cause not many people in Boston do camera stuff. And I hung out with him and I was actually amazed at how untalented he was. But he told me when we hung out, like the first time we hung out, he was like, I'm getting booked for this shoot. Um, like I'm going to get paid like a quarter million dollars by this guy to like, uh, be his full-time videographer, like, oh, Jay Cole's, you know, going to get me to do a music video. And he was actually delusional. Like, none of this was true. Two years after I met him, I, uh, I go to uh, this, like, coffee shop in Boston to meet up with him. And he walks in, like, 10 minutes late, white as a ghost. And I'm like, what's up, Tony? And he's like, I just got off the phone with Will and Jaden Smith. And I'm going on a world tour with Jaden and like his whole crew. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like there's, there's no, like he's still honestly at the time, he still wasn't that good. That tour made him insane. Now he's producing videos for J. Cole. Oh yeah, he he's doing it. Yeah. He, he's actually doing it. Yeah. So when, he, but this is why when you told me I'm the best in the world, I wasn't like, I, I, I wasn't like, um, I wasn't skeptical at all. I was like, if he believes it, it is, it is true. And it is going to manifest to the point where no one could potentially doubt it. So my question. <laughs> <laughs> my question for you, as you look down on yourself. I kind of like it. It's funny. You should leave it. Yeah. My question for you is, uh, how do you, how do you get that certain in your mind? Like, how do you make suggestions to yourself that turn into beliefs? Yeah, so those two things. I think that, you know, Jack, pay attention. Thank you. When you're distracted, I'm distracted. Don't be distracted. All right. There we go. So I think the, the best way to explain it to you is I actually am the best. I'm the best because I've been around the best and I'm better. Okay. So, you know, and you would be shocked as to how easy it is to be the best in the world at something. It's okay. not that hard. Most people <laughs> okay. who are the best spent like a year working their ass off and then they stopped because the guy before them spent like eight months and yeah. the guy before that spent like six. You it's, know what? I actually kind of agree with that. I think that like people don't think that they can be the best. So they aim for like above average. And so actually the most competitive thing to do is to be above average because no one's trying to be the best. No one has the balls to say they're the best. So it just, they don't people, become the best. Well, if you don't think you can be the best, you're never going to work to be the best. So that's in my actually mind, extremely interesting. That's a breakthrough for me. Really? I'm, yeah. I'm competitive. Yeah. I'm like, I got to be the best in the world, whatever I do. So I set my mind to something. I'll give you an example. When I was in high school, I started playing football. I said, I'm going to be the best player on the court. Two weeks in, we had a tournament. I was on JV. We had a tournament and we were division one school. So our JV team would shit on most varsity teams, right? We, 54 teams, undefeated. We had the best JV season ever inside that entire high school, right? Uh, and then all 54 teams, all coaches unanimously said I was the best player in the tournament. Two weeks into playing, I've never played this fucking sport in my life. I get brought up to varsity, win a championship, right? First semester ever playing volleyball. And I can tell you that that's probably the easiest sport 
I ever played. <laughs> and I played basketball. I was yeah. varsity basketball, varsity football, varsity track. You know, I was an athlete. But before I was an athlete, I was fat. And they're like, you're never going to be a good athlete. And then I became the best athlete at every sport I was in. Mm. Now, you know, I go on stage. I had a lisp. I wasn't a good speaker. I was a shit hypnotist. Could not hypnotize anybody. Now I'm the best. Why? Because <laughs> I studied it. I was passionate. I listened yeah. to Tony Robbins talk all the time. I listened to Jim Rohn talk all the time. I listened to Brendan Burchard talk all the time. I listened to Ed Milet talk all the time. I listened to Gary Vee talk all the time. I listened. I watched Darren Brown, who I thought was a hypnotist. He is a hypnotist, but most of what he was doing was mentalism. Mm. I didn't see it through that lens. I saw it through the lens of hypnosis. So he'd walk up to people. And he'd, for example, go to a horse race. He'd have a losing ticket. He'd say, this is the winning ticket. Give it back to them. And like, oh, you're right. My bad. Now, I thought he's hypnotizing them. What he was doing was sleight of hand. He was actually swapping out the winning ticket. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that. So I'm watching this. I'm thinking, wow, this guy's literally hypnotizing people. This is fucking crazy. He's doing all this crazy stuff. And then I decided, well, why don't I go do it? And I started finding ways to get things like this done. I started doing things that were just unheard of. Because I wanted to optimize for being the best seminar speaker in the world. You call people up on stage, you knock them out in two seconds, you change their life in two seconds. I don't have time to sit there and be like, close your eyes, relax. Mm. All these other hypnotists do it. And when I was studying hypnosis, the best hypnotist there was making seven, eight K a month. At 40 clients charging $150 to $200 a session. And the most expensive guy was charging $350 if you were to come to his office and $700 if you were to go to his house or he would come to your house. And I'm like, that is expensive. Like now I think about it, mm. I'm like, this is insane. Right? And I'm like, how much does Tony Robbins charge? Charges a million a year in equity in the company. I'm like, cool. I'll charge the same because I'm better. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at Grant Cardone, how much does he charge? 40K for a month, 50K. You know, you look at yeah. uh, Patrick Bet David, I think it's like 40K a session or something, or maybe for three calls or something like that. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, look, they're good. They're knowledgeable. They're smart business guys, but they're not better than me at changing someone's mindset. There is nobody who can do it faster and more permanently. You were at an event with 15 people. What are two testimonials that happened in that same exact week from two people, one of them you brought to the mm -hmm. event? Well, I would mention three. Two guys made a million dollars like the next day. In one day. Yeah. And one yeah. of them was never made a million dollars in his whole fucking career. Yeah. And he made a million in a day. Yeah. And the other one was, was Jack, Jack Bratzett. Your who, camera guy. Yeah, he was my camera guy. And he wanted to be a DJ. And he wanted to be like a you know world traveling DJ. And the day that the event ended, he got booked at one of the, like, like a very ex exclusive nightclub in New York City, uh, two venues. And now he's literally in Cape Town DJing, like some of the best parties in the world. Like, it, it's just yeah, like, I mean, it's, it's, it's absurd. Yeah. You know, you want to ask me what it takes to be the best? I'll tell you two things. It's actually very simple. One, it's confidence. you got to believe inside of you that you're going to be the best. Now, what does it take to be the best? How, how hard are you willing to work to be the best? I would sleep four hours a night. I would watch for eight hours a day. I would watch videos of others being hypnotized, watch the same video over and over and over again, ingrain what they're saying, how they're saying it, their body language, trying to figure out what the fuck are they doing. Didn't make sense to me because I taught myself how to be this good on YouTube. Then I said, okay, well, what is it? And I'd go out and I'd do it and I'd go do it and I'd go do it. So I think the confidence actually taking action. You need the confidence to take the action. And the second thing is simplifying. I think anything that is simplified allows you to be the best. Do you think Michael Jordan looks at basketball and goes, now this is really fucking hard. Like this is, I don't understand this. This is super hard. No, Michael Jackson looks, just close the door guys, please. Thank you. All right. Does Michael Jackson look at it and go, uh, uh, Michael Jordan look at it and go, oh, basketball super hard. No, he simplified the game. Kobe Bryant simplified the game. Everything that makes you the best in the world is simple. Public speaking is simple. You cannot be monotone. Monotone means mono tempo, monotonality, mono storytelling, lack of engagement, lack of pauses. Like everything that you do when you speak should be different to keep engagement. And same thing in hypnosis. I need authority. I need speed. I need to do it. I need to be able to, uh, to interrupt a pattern and then execute in that moment. I got to find opportunities. There are windows of opportunity where someone goes into trance and I can either capitalize on that window, create the window, or force the window open, and then you can hypnotize someone in an instant. And I think a lot of people don't see it simply. You have to simplify the map in your head. The more you overcomplicate it, the less you understand, and the worse you're going to be at it. Those perfectionist people who procrastinate, people who are like, I need to get better, you truly do. But you don't need to get better at the skill. You need to get better at simplifying the skill. You need mm -hmm. to get better at taking action on the skill. You need to be more confident in the skill. And if you do, you'll execute. When I hypnotize someone to come on stage, I have videos of this, and I do this at Limitless, I hypnotize people and I will do this at Limitless this time around. 
I will get people on stage and I will hypnotize these people to be me. And you will see average normal people become world-class public speakers at the snap of my finger. Someone who has a fear of public speaking, someone who has zero confidence, will instantly get into a state where they could talk and talk and talk in a flow state with charisma, engagement, emotion, passion, all in an instant. Because they now have the belief and the software that allows them to do it. Being the best is not about studying. It is about installing the right software that tells you you're the best and subsequently you become the best. Why is Max Verstappen so good? Formula One driver for Red Bull, besides the fact that he's in the fastest car ever. Why? He has no fear. Mm. He has zero fear. Mm. And if you look at his lower eyelids, they're super smooth. My friend Chase Hughes talks about this. He's the one who taught me this and he's super accurate. Skepticism does what? When you're skeptical, you go like this. You get lines on the eyelids, right? Mm. Anyone in a cult who's ever been in a cult, super smooth lower eyelids. Looks like Max Verstappen. Now, what else is that? The best athletes in the world. Super smooth lower eyelids. Because what if athletes... Because they're not going like this? Because they're not skeptical. Because they've been coached their whole life. Mm. Their whole life, someone has told them how to improve. They've had to be open-minded. They've had to get better. The most suggestible people are the most successful. Uh, because okay. they sometimes, sometimes, unfortunately, they get stuck in a horrible environment. But they have the most potential mm. to be successful. Because they're willing to change and they're the most easily able to go into a trance where they're not in their own way. Mm. So when he gets in the car, a Formula One car, let's process what's actually happening. You're going 200 miles an hour, pulling four to six Gs, four to six times that of gravity in different directions, lateral directions. I mean, lie down on your face and you notice your face falls. Now imagine six times the weight of your face going to the side while driving mm. a car, needing to stay focused. And if you see how fast the road in front of you is coming up and you have to brake, slow down, balance the car, turn the car, the amount of reflex you need to have and how fast your brain has to be, you cannot consciously interfere for a moment. The second you consciously get in your head, your subconscious mind backs off. Now you're no longer the best in the world. And the difference between the best in the world in Formula One versus the worst is milliseconds. It's seconds, mm -hmm. it's moments. But those moments, that, that difference between who breaks a little bit later, who's perfect is what? It's them having no fear. No fear equals unconscious pattern. They are in a trance. The brain gets in a trance. They do not perceive them dying. They do not perceive an accident. They do not perceive anyone being worse. They see themselves going to the front. Do you know when someone becomes the fastest? When they're in the front. When they're in the middle, they're the slowest. When they're in the back, they're the slowest. Mm. Because there's a limitation. There's someone in front of you. There's someone above you. Mm. So when you say you're the best, you actually allow yourself to reach your potential. The second you're not the best, there's always someone above you. Now, if I'm the best and I chill, like most people do, then I won't stay the best. But if I continue to grind, I will always be the best mm. because there's no one who can do it what I can do because nobody thinks about emotions the way I do. I am, I, I believe I am more revolutionary in the world of psychology than Sigmund Freud was. I believe I'm more revolutionary in the world of psychology than Richard Bandler was. I am by far the most revolutionary personal development individual who ever lived in terms <laughs> of skill. I'm not even just saying it. In terms of skill and what I can accomplish, I am the most knowledgeable and the most innovative. Nobody's ever done what I've done. I've taken what I've learned from all these people. And guess what? Sigmund Freud, cool theories, useless for results, useless. NLP, pretty cool, way less effective than hypnosis. People are like, what's the difference? The difference is NLP is a conscious act that allows you to do subconscious things. Hypnosis, get the fuck out of my way. I'm going to change your fucking mind. Now, people say you can't be hypnotized. Not everyone can be hypnotized. Yeah, because not everyone's a good hypnotist. Actually, almost every hypnotist someone will ever meet is garbage. It's so bad that they can only hypnotize the easiest subjects in the world because they don't have the knowledge or the skill set. No shit, you're not going to get a change. It, it's just, it does not make sense. They're like, well, studies show scientists, a scientist is not a hypnotist. Mm -hmm. Okay, just because you're a scientist doesn't mean you fucking go hypnotize tens of thousands of people all the time. So you're going to read a script and you're going to tell me, hello, I am a boring, not confident scientist. And I'm going to get these people to go in. Yeah, you're right. 70% of people will be hypnotized that way. Not 100 because you're not a fucking hypnotist. You're a fucking scientist. Get me in front of them and let's see what the percentage looks like. That's the difference. Mm. And I think a lot of people just don't understand. It's like there's something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. You know what that is? Uh, share. Dunning-Kruger effect is uh, the ignorance behind someone like a doctor or you know, a psychologist or a therapist or a psychiatrist or just anyone who's an expert in the field and they think they're smarter than they are and they know more than they do. So sometimes I have therapists like, I have a, I have a PhD in psychology. Okay, bitch. What are you going to do for someone? Show me. 
Bring your client. Let's see who's going to fix your client faster. Who's going to fix you? 10 years, they've been suicidal. They can go on you. Does that mean you're good because they've been seeing you for 10 years? And you prescribe medication? No, it means that you don't know what you're fucking doing. And that's the truth. That's what they've been taught. They've been taught how to not be equipped with the right tools. They're taught, you don't have, psychology is not that hard. You don't need eight years to learn about psychology. You can learn five or six effective tools that will change your life dramatically. That will change anybody's life dramatically. Mm. And it's like, it's like fundamentals. Mm. If I go to play basketball, the best fundamentals in the world are in shooting, keep a straight elbow, follow through. But most people learn things that waste their fucking time. And if you're going to waste your time, it better not be with something that's holding you back. Mm. So I always tell people, when does change happen? Happens in an instant. Now. Change guys, right fucking now. I, I want to just talk to the camera for a second. Yeah. Yeah. Um, guys, there's a link in the description for a free event. Uh, I want to see you there because I've, uh, I've never met anyone like Marcel. There's a reason that I, I'm like excited about this to bring all of my audience to it. I know this is obviously on Marcel's channel. Just come to the event, book a ticket. We have people coming from like Colombia. We have people flying in from Dubai. We have people flying in from all over the world. If you're making an excuse not to come, um, that's ridiculous because it's going to be a lot of fun. It's free and figure it out. You know, it, like if, it, if it's a financial concern, go make more money, be, be more resourceful. Marcel always says this. He says, you're so resourceful at being unresourceful. What is it? You're so, resource you're so resourceful at being unresourceful. Yeah. You're so good at finding why you can't. Now, here, I'll give, I'll give a great example. In April of 2019, there was an event called M3 Accelerator in Las Vegas at the Palms Hotel. My friend Tyler, he's also a hypnotist, goes, hey, let's go to this event and you know, let's crash the event. I'm like, bro, I have $150 in my account. I have, a, I have money for a one-way ticket there. He's like, don't worry, we'll sell people there. I'm like, are you sure? He's like, I do this all the time, don't worry about it. I'm like, well, we're gonna sleep. He's like, we'll figure it out. I've been to, I think, 20 something states and mm. I always sleep at someone's yeah. house. I'm like, bro, it's super uncomfortable. He's like, you know that you should be more confident. I'm like, well, I guess I gotta live for that. Skip the ads, bro, please. Press skip ads. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. All right. So, anyways, so I end up flying to to this hotel. I finesse a VIP ticket. I'm like, yeah, I have a VIP ticket. I'm like, I, I want to hurry up though and get it. And then I see on a door it says speaker room. I'm like, fuck this VIP ticket. I take it off my neck. I put it in my you know jacket. And I walk into the speaker room. I start networking, networking with the speakers. They're looking at me like, who is this guy? And I talk to one of them, and she has stage fright. She's like, I don't want to go up. I'm like, I'll take your slot. No problem. And I'm about to take her slot, but the person before me actually went into her slot and she didn't have to speak. Mm. I'm like, damn, fuck that guy. Mm. But I almost finessed the way to speak in front of like 300 people. Anyways, I ended up going there. I, I networked so efficiently that someone who was staying in the penthouse suite in the Palms gave me their master bedroom, told me you could sleep there. And I ended up making a yeah. shit ton of money there. I, I filled my first ever paid seminar yeah. Yeah, at yeah. that event. I just sold everyone. And look, I had no idea what to do. Now I'm not telling you to come to my event and sell people. It's not all I'm saying. What I am saying though is, I put it all on the line. I said, I'm yeah. going and I don't know how I'm coming back. I don't know where I'm staying. I have a similar story. And this, this actually makes me feel like this event, if you actually don't have resources, is such a huge opportunity for an insanely epic experience. What? The, the Not, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like a yeah, thumbs up. I, I thought that's Apple, but what is it? Is it fucking? Yeah. Anyway, um, so in, in 2018, I was in Australia. Um, I, I flew down there. I didn't know anybody. It was a study abroad uh, program, but I didn't know anyone in the program. And I had made up my mind before I went to Australia that I was going to have the best network in Australia possible when it comes to like growing on social media. So I didn't have any connections at all. I just showed up and it turned out that the first weekend that I was there was VidCon Australia. You know VidCon, yeah? yeah. So it's like the YouTube conference. And so I was like, that's great. Everyone on YouTube, everyone who's like an influencer, entrepreneur, social media person is going to go to this event, is going to go to VidCon. Problem was, I didn't have a ticket. I didn't have an invite. I had zero connections. VidCon was six hours. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Wow. This is actually amazing. This is like made my day. I was, wow. So... VidCon is six hours away. Um, I, uh, I had no ticket. I had no connections at all. But I decided to just go and just see what happened. 
I didn't actually, I didn't even have a place to stay. So I showed up. Um, actually, the full story is I posted on my story to see if any of my, if I had any Australian followers. Turns out I had a follower from Australia uh, who was like down to go with me and help me film and just be friends. So his name's Aaron Matt. Uh, I met up with Aaron. I stayed at his uh, mom and dad's house, which was like an hour outside of Sydney. His parents drove us to the airport. We had we, we took a flight down to Melbourne, uh, six hour flight. It's like New York to LA basically. And I showed up to VidCon, no ticket, no nothing. And I just started talking to people. And I just, I was like, excuse me, like how can I get the ticket? And they were like, everything's sold out, there's no way. But I just believed that I was gonna somehow get in. And I ended up getting, uh, like it, I was probably, networking and trying to figure it out for like four hours. Uh, and it was before the event had started. And finally, I meet this woman. She's wearing this like blue executive badge and she's American in Australia. And she happened to be from, from Boston, which is where I'm from. And I connected with her. I was, like, I was like, hey, you know, here's the situation. I flew down here. I'm kind of just YOLOing this. I have no plan. I have no way to get into any of the, the event rooms. I have no way to meet any of the influencers, but I'm here for a few months in Australia. And I wanted to meet YouTubers because I'm trying to be a YouTuber. And she gave me her pass, like her executive pass. So I had more access than Liza Koshy, Emma Chamberlain, all the like influencers that were being flown in. And I ended up meeting every YouTuber in Australia that weekend. And I had the, the highest level access to everything. I could go backstage if I wanted to. It was, it, so, so my point is, if you just have unwavering belief, even if you have no money and you have nowhere to stay, <clears throat> you'll just figure it out. Like you just click the link in the description. It's free. The one that I, I was ended up going to was, uh, it was, you know, it was either invite only or you had to spend like four or $500. So, I went, I just went and I figured it out. Well, last year I decided to go to Halloween Horror Nights. I went like 10 times, but I brought like 10 of my friends the first time. And the lines for Halloween Horror Nights, if you've never been, it's this awesome event, Universal Studios, where, you know, it's, it's like you got all these mazes to go into, you know, each maze is like walking through a movie, pretty much a horror movie that they've had. And they're all different themed. And the lines are like two, three hours long. Now, I don't know if you know me well enough, but I don't wait in fucking line. <laughs> I don't wait in line. Yeah. So somehow all 10 of us would go to the line and we would just go right to the front every time. My friends are like thinking, everyone thought, because I tell them like, yeah, I got us this pass. We're good to go because I bought the tickets for everyone. <laughs> and at the end of the night, they're like, so where's the pass? And they look at the ticket. It's like a regular general admission pass like how have you been doing this and i go yep <laughs> and they're just yeah. like what the fuck yeah. the whole night i just got us into every maze without a line because yeah, you do that a lot i remember we had a dinner reservation for four people at one of the nicest restaurants in la like very difficult to get a reservation and it was supposed to be you me chloe and like you plus one and oh, no, it was john zerka you were supposed to bring zerka mm. and it was a reservation for four and you call me 20 minutes before the reservation and you're like, Hey Arlen, it's going to be 12, 12 people. And I was like, bro, that's not going to work. And, and you go, don't worry. I'll just hypnotize them. <laughs> <laughs> and we show up and sure enough, you basically, I don't know. You just said, you, I don't know what you did. I, I have no idea what you did, but we had a 12 person table within like a, two minutes. Yeah. They sat us down right away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Disneyland, I don't wait in lines. Like, yeah. like, I mean, that's, like, that's how do the, you do that? Can you teach us? Like, actually I can. So, okay. um, all right. So there's a couple things. The first thing you have to realize is these people that work at these places, it's not that big a deal to them. If someone sat down or cut the line, like it's something that they deal with for three minutes, two minutes, and then they forget about it. It never exists in their mind. It's actually the lower of imp the less significance or importance you give it, the easier it'll be. The problem people have is that someone says no and you go, what the fuck you mean? No. Now you made it a big deal. They now have a, a vendetta against you and will not let you in. It's all about nonchalant. That's number one. You mm -hmm. want to keep everything under the radar. That's one. Two, you have to realize they're on autopilot. They're in a fucking trance. They're like, all right, let me see your ticket. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. You're good to go. <laughs> hey, what's, what's the name of the reservation? Okay. And then in their mind, they're going to go read it. So what happens when you're going through a pattern is – you, I'll be like, hey, you know, let's say you're a host. Ask me, you know, what's the name under? Uh, hi, what's the name under? Uh, by the way, where's the restroom? It's under Marcel. Where's the restroom? 
Um, it's over there. It's I for think. eight, correct? That's awesome. And it's over there, you said? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, it's Thanks. over there. Perfect. All right. And the table's ready? Your call is for eight when it's ready? Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's well, wrong. It's, it's for eight. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. We'll call you. Awesome. <laughs> right? And, that's good. Because <laughs> <laughs> you see, you're like, I mean, that's wrong. But yeah. casually, and I just go for <laughs> yeah. eight. Because then yeah. in their brain, it goes, oh, I guess it's for eight. Yeah. They don't even question it anymore. Because you made it not a big deal. Now, that seems really simple, and it is. But to execute it, you have to have unwavering confidence, perfect timing, and you have to be aware of what's going on. <laughs> that's wrong. It's for eight. Yeah. That's so good. But casually, that's wrong. Yeah. It's for eight. So it's over there. And yeah. Change subject. So it just goes in their mind. Yeah. Kind of like a sandwich. Now, another thing you could do is it's like I remember when I was 18, I used to get into every club with my ID. Mm -hmm. I didn't want a fake ID. I wanted my ID. And the way I would do it is I'd walk up to the bouncer. I'd go to give him my ID. Now, normally, you just give the ID. They take the ID, right? Mm -hmm. I go to give the ID. I pause right when I give it to them. So they freeze. And mm -hmm. their brain gets confused in that moment. They're like, wait, <laughs> yeah. what the fuck? But unconsciously, the brain goes, what's going on here? It's a pattern interrupt. It's confusion. But unconscious confusion. In that yeah. moment, they become extremely suggestible. So a bouncer looks at the ID, and then he reviews the birthday, and he goes, you're good. Go ahead. You're fine. Right? That's what he'll say to himself. Yeah. So if I give him the ID and I pause and I'm and I say and I embed it in like a story. This is a story Darren Brown actually has. You know, it's so funny. My friends told me to come here and I was thinking I should or I shouldn't. And you know, I'm like, all right, you know what? Fuck it. Because then they go, you're good, you're fine. Go ahead. As I'm giving him the ID, you're good, you're fine. Yeah, go ahead, you're fine, yeah. you're good. And they're like, you're good. Thanks. Hundred percent success rate. Yeah. In Vegas, in LA, anywhere I've been, mm. New York, hundred percent success rate. Yeah, I remember when when I first when I was around 18, I first started trying to get into bars. Uh, I was not good at this at all. I would get super nervous. I definitely didn't have the Marcel hypnotist skills. But after a while, you know, 19, 20, you know, uh, 21, obviously you're 21, you don't have to worry about it. But um, there was this one like very exclusive um, uh, party in Brooklyn, and it was uh, it was it was a New York Fashion Week party. And I was in a, I was in a sprinter van with six of my friends, seven of my friends, um, four girls, four, four guys, and none of us had tickets for the event. And not only that, uh, for some reason, none of us had our, um, oh, you know what it was? It wasn't IDs. It was the, it was the pat, the, the New York was so strict with the COVID passports mm. and none of us had them, uh, except for one girl. And what we ended up doing was. We somehow, I don't know how we made it work, but we just had so much experience. Like you came to my seminar? Yeah, we 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 came to Limitless exactly. Link in the description, but click the link. Go we ahead. we literally like went up to the bouncer, showed one vaccine passport, and then distracted him, passed it back to the next person, passed it back. Meanwhile, it, it was a girl's name on it. It was like uh Tegan. And like it was like Tegan, Tegan, Tegan for eight people. COVID passport said Tegan. And we all got in. It was so hilarious. Autopilot. Yeah. Yeah. It's just it, it, people are on autopilot and most people come to the event are going to be on autopilot and I'm going to mm. snap you out of it. Um, here's, here's something I'll tell you that I think is funny. If you're going to be on autopilot 95% of the time, which is what most people are, mm. you're on autopilot almost every waking moment of the day. You think your thoughts are your thoughts. You think you swiping on your phone, pulling out your phone. And the first thing you do is you click on the left bottom left corner of the screen because you want to go on Instagram or you open up Twitter or any of that. You think you do that consciously. Today, I'm going to spend three hours on Instagram or TikTok. You think you did that consciously? You think you woke up and you decide that you're going to do the same thing every morning, like a routine, like OCD? No, you didn't do it consciously. That's what you're programmed to do. And if you're not programmed to make money, you'll only be conscious two, three, four percent of the day. And the rest of it, you're going to go back into your shit routine, which has made your life look the way it is. I don't care how good your life is. It could be better. And that's my job. My job is to take that autopilot so even when you're sitting there and you're sleepwalking throughout the day, you accidentally end up where you want it to go. That's my job. My job is to accidentally take you where you want it to go. And you could try to fuck it up, but 3 to 4% of the time, you can only try. And the rest of the time, you will unconsciously make the right choice. Oh, shit. Here I am. I'm a trader. Why is my intuition telling me to sell right now? Because I should. Your brain knows. And then, oh my God, look, I made all this money. I actually sold at the high. Ha, ha, ha. Oh, you know, I should buy right now. Click. Oh, wow, look, I bought at the low. Ha, ha, ha. You think you thought about that? Your brain did the calculation. You know, something inside of me saying, tonight I'm going to go out to this restaurant, invite these friends, I'm going to make a reservation, and I'm going to dress up and get a haircut. 
You go out and you get there, you're at the host stand. And at the same exact time, your reservation, the exact person you've been searching for, for your company, your partner, your future husband or wife, they just happen to walk in at that time. What a miracle. Or was it that your brain knew that if you wanted to meet someone like this, the highest likelihood of it happening was for you to go to this type of place at this time on this day? That's exactly what it is. Don't underestimate how intelligent your subconscious actually is. Your subconscious intelligence is vastly more intelligent than your conscious potential. You have no idea how powerful the mind is when it's programmed to get what it wants. Mm. And the problem we have is if you were programmed to have a shitty mindset and you were programmed to think like shit your whole life, your parents said you can't do it. They looked at you and they said, you know, making money is hard. And that's mm. what's in your fucking head. You won't even question most of your beliefs. And that's your fucking problem. Don't sit there and go, and look, I know so many men. You know what men, a male's biggest problem is? There's two problems a man has. A man's problem is financial and relationship. I've mastered specifically in terms of social dynamics and dating. I've mastered that. I, I can help men and women. I know exactly why a relationship works, why it doesn't, because it's the same fucking pattern every time. When you look at business and you know why someone is failing, it's exactly the same things every time. It is not complicated. You're like, well, my business is unique. Your business ain't fucking unique. You either make more money than you spend or you're not making money. If you don't keep what you make, then you're not making money. It's simple. So how do you make more money? There's only so many fucking ways to do it. I do not care what business you're in. That's how it works. In terms of dating, you either are dating someone you like or you're not. And they're treating you the way you deserve to be treated or they're not. And you're either happy or you're not. Don't overcomplicate your life. The only thing that's complicated is the fact that you have a pattern of focus that doesn't let you see the truth and continues to complicate your life by telling you all sorts of shit, like misdirection. It's like being in a maze of mirrors. Mm. And everywhere you look, you think is the way out, but mm. it's not. Mm. And all you got to do is shatter the mirrors, shatter the limiting beliefs, shatter the fucking thing that's blinding you from the way out. And you notice that the exit was one step away. That exit for you. The way to shadow your limiting beliefs is so simple. And I'm going to give you the answer right now. And if you haven't done it yet, you might have already done it and you didn't know it. But I'm about to give you the secret. You ready for the secret? I'm excited. There's I'm a... on the fucking edge of my seat right now, bro. Let's go. <laughs> and this, by the way, this is a decision that I guarantee you will shadow this for you. Everyone watching this, if you want to hear this, go ahead and comment a one on the chat. I'm looking at the TV right now. There's a massive 85 inch flat screen right there. Comment a one on the chat if you want to hear how to shatter the mirror in the maze that you're in that is preventing you from going to the next level. If I get enough ones here, I will tell you that secret in two seconds. Now, I'm going to give you, there's a two part, there's two parts to the secret and I'm going to give you both. Here we go. Now, the first part, which is hysterical, but it's true, is to click the link in the description and sign up for the fucking seminar. <laughs> the second part is to ask yourself, am I where I want to be? If the answer to that is no, then there's a solution. And the solution is simple. Come to the fucking event or actually pay attention to everything that I post and put everything you have into it. Why? Most people who do personal development do not have the ability to pierce through the conscious mind. They will tell you it takes hard work. What does Gary Vee always say? You got to work hard. Yeah, you do got to work hard, but you also got to work effectively. Most of the time we work on shit that is useless. We do so much that doesn't get us where we're going because it doesn't matter how hard you work. If your brain isn't wired for it, Arlen, if your brain isn't wired for it, those of you at home, you'll never get there. I have a very famous quote. <clears throat> it's been literally reposted a million times. I don't get credit for it. It says unknown, but it's my quote. I don't care how bad you want to succeed. If your brain is programmed to fail, no matter how hard you try, you will fail. If your brain is programmed to make money, no matter how much you try to be broke, you'll always be rich. Whatever you're programmed to get is exactly what you're gonna get. If you look at your life and you wanna say, what am I programmed to get? Look at how much you weigh. Look at your bank account. Look at your social situation. Look at your pattern. What does my life look like repetitively over this year? 
I constantly get cheated on. I constantly end up being broke. I'm always making a bunch of money and then losing it. I always plateau at this number. My bank account has never been greater than this. Then those are the limits of your mind. And if you want to exceed those limits, we have to reprogram something. There's something in your mind that's stopping you. And every time there's a massive breakthrough in your mind, unconsciously, to go to the next level, it is always instant. Mm. There's a moment where you have a, oh, shit. And then you make more money. Oh, shit. And then there's an idea. And you execute on it. But there's another thing that I noticed that stops people. It's not that you don't know you need to change. Is that you're not willing to change. Most of us know we want a better life. But if you believe it's not possible and you believe it's going to be very hard to do, what's going to happen? You're never going to take action on it. Here's another really famous thing I invented when I was 18 because I thought about it myself. I said, what if I won the lottery? And I went and I bought a lottery ticket. I'm at the gas station. I buy this lottery ticket. I have $3 left. And I said, how lucky would it be for me to win a $100 million or $200 million mega jackpot lottery? So I spent two bucks on this lottery. I had a dollar left, and that was it. What are you going to buy with a dollar, even in 2016? And I go, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, ah, you know what? I'm not going to check. It's a waste of money. I don't know why I bought it. I'm like, it's just a fucking lottery ticket. There's no way I'm going to win. So I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm thinking, but what if I do win? And I'm debating whether or not I go to this gas station a few days later to check. I'm in my room. I barely have any gas left in my tank. I'm like, do I use it? Do I use the little gas I have left to go check this lottery ticket or not? And I'm debating, do I go check or not? I didn't want to go. There was a feeling in me that said, why would I go? Because I knew I didn't win. I said, but then there was a small voice in my head that said, what if you did win? So I put on my clothes and I said, you know what? I fucking won this lottery. I get in my car, I drive there, I give the thing to him. And I'm sitting in my mind, I'm like, I'm about to fucking win this lottery. And he checks it and it goes, eh, I didn't win. And I was like, fuck, I didn't win. But I did win because I just had the biggest insight of my life in that moment. And I sat there. I was almost tears from excitement because of the insight I had. I said, what if this lottery ticket was my goals? And the difference between me taking action on my goals was my belief that I'm going to get them and I'm going to achieve them and accomplish them versus me not. And if you don't think you have the winning lottery ticket, you don't think you're going to actually accomplish your goals. You'll never take action on them. Mm. And you're never going to cash in that winning lottery. So ticket. simple, but it's, it's the ultimate truth. We all have yeah. a winning lottery ticket. The question yeah is are you willing to do what it takes to cash it in? Are you willing to put in that extra mile, spend that last dollar, fly into Los Angeles and change your fucking life to cash in your willing, winning lottery ticket? Are you willing to do it? Mm. And if the answer to that is no, then it means deep down you're programmed to think that you don't have a winning lottery ticket. Mm. And Fuck, that's good. And That's really good. And you really do have a winning lottery ticket. So let me show you how to cash it in. Mm. And I want to show you. I want to take you there. And I will take you there. Just trust me and come, come to me. Come to LA. Please give me the opportunity to change your life. If you've never been, I don't care where you're at. Find a way. I, am, I was born to do this. There was no other reason for me to do this. And I'm telling you, everything is working against me. There is some negative entity. I don't know if it's spiritual. I don't know if it's people. There's something that's always against me. Always. There's always this fucking thing that I'm battling, like I'm at war with. Deleting Instagram is an example. There's just always some bullshit that's against me. It never goes the way I want it to go. But I do not care because I have something greater than whatever it is that's trying to stop me. And that greater motivation is that I'm going to change your life. I'm going to take you from where you are and I will show you how to shatter the fucking maze of mirrors and cash in your fucking lottery ticket. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it for my best friends. I'm going to do it for you. And I'm going to continue to do it for myself. Mm. Can we get some hundreds in the chat for Marcel here? This is, uh, I, I'm excited because this is, this is the best I've ever seen you, like in this moment right now. I think you're feeling like you're starting to see the event. Well, I'm starting, to get, I'm starting to get back into the state of the event. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and I know that this is only like 1%. Of it how is 1%. They... I, I'm telling you, when I say I'm the best, it's not like how I was before. Like yeah. Now I'm starting to get in the zone. And when I'm in the zone, I am in the zone. So I, and it's because I'm focused on them. I, I'm genuinely more focused on the audience right now than I am on anyone else. And that's mm. why I'm starting to feel this way. Yeah. You know, and there's, there's one more thing I want to share with the audience. There are moments in your life where everyone will tell you that it is impossible to accomplish your goals. I specifically remember the person I'm closest to, my mother, telling me that I am the biggest idiot and she fucked up as a mom <laughs> and she's the biggest failure as a mother which is the worst. And it sounds funny, but at the time it was, it was fucking heavy. Yeah. Right. And, and she's telling me that I'm sitting at this Mexican restaurant 
my dad's across from me, my sister's next to me, and my mom's sitting there. And I just told him I dropped out of college. I'm going to go pursue this career as a public speaker and coach, hypnotist. And my mom's almost in tears because her whole pride, from when I'm a little kid, she's telling everyone, what are you going to be when you grow up? A plastic surgeon. A plastic surgeon. Mm. Now, I said, I'm not going to be a fucking plastic surgeon. I started seeing, hey, I'm, I'm 19 years old. I'm going to be in school until I'm 32. And only then will I start to make some money. I don't want to do this. I did the math. I said, I want yachts. I want mansions. I want cars. Mm. As a plastic surgeon, I won't get that till I'm 40. Mm. Imagine I'm 25. I still am in med school. I would still be in medical school today. Like, what the fuck? Mm. Hell no. So I said, no, I need to find a way to do something that I'm more passionate about. And the one thing I was so passionate about was, was the mind. Mm. I was always passionate about confidence. I was always passionate about personal development. I just mm. didn't know anyone who did it. I didn't know who Tony Robbins was until after my first seminar when someone told me, you remind me of Tony Robbins. I was mm. like, who the fuck is Tony Robbins? <laughs> I wish I get to meet Tony Robbins. I love him. But the point being, there are going to be moments where the people you love the most may not even believe in your dream. But they're not people who help people accomplish their dreams. Like if someone you love the most, you get the flu and they tell you you're going to die from this flu, right? Are they qualified to say that even if they're a fucking doctor? Maybe not. Then you're going to go to the best doctor in the world and they're going to tell you, no, you're not only not going to die from this flu, this flu will make you a lot stronger and you're going to be way better off. Wow, that's really empowering. Well, I want you to view me as that doctor. I'm the guy who helps people accomplish their dreams time and time again. And not only accomplish the dream, but make the dream so much bigger than what they ever thought possible. So when your closest friends and your family and the people that you're really close to are like, well, they know me better. Yeah, they may know you better, but they don't know the best version of you better. I know that version of you better than you know that version of you. And I know that version of you that will accomplish everything you set your mind to. And because of that, I am so sure that everyone who's watching this has the ability and not only the ability will actually, if they, if they listen to me here, if they take action after this and they not only show up, but they just commit to, they just say, you know what? Fuck what everyone says. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a crazy person. I'm going to be so fucking crazy. No matter what I'm accomplish my goals. I'm going to, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to quit my fucking job. I'm going to go after what I want. I'm going to burn the bridge, burn the boats. And I'm just going to take the, I'm going to take the Island. I promise you, I will bet everything that you'll make it happen. When they say, don't put all your eggs in one basket, let's give you context. Mm. That's an investment strategy because all investments over the course of time will eventually go down 20, 30% at some point. So if you diversify your investments, you'll make it happen. I was watching a podcast with Tony Robbins yesterday and he was talking about how Ray Dalio said, there's one investment strategy that he believes is the best investment strategy over, overall. And it'll give you a 13 to 20 X compounding return year after year, no matter what. If you find eight to 12 things to invest in that are not correlated, for example, real estate and crypto, there's correlation between their markets. One goes down, one might go up, right? There's correlation between gold and the dollar. If you find eight to 12 markets that are uncorrelated and you invest in those things, you'll have a 13 to 20% compounding return year after year mm. and potentially even 20 to 40. It's the greatest return of any investment. And that's why he's the best investor and best CEO of the best hedge fund of all time. Mm. That's what he figured out. Now, the same way you look at investment strategies, let me tell you what the best strategy to do for a compounding return on your psychology is overall. Cut out all drugs and alcohol, get into health, become extremely hydrated, go to the gym, become active, and start fueling your brain with things that empower you and motivate you. If you're getting motivated every day, that is a sign that you are getting closer to your goals. If you're sitting there defeated, depressed, mm. anxious, unhappy, that tells me, that the knowledge and information you are receiving from your environment is cancerous. Mm. And the cancer doesn't just kill you. It kills your fucking dreams. Mm. That's the worst thing that can happen to someone. I have a topic and a question. So Go this ahead. actually came from, uh, from a, I think everyone watching understands why, uh, even though Marcel's one of my, one of my best friends, why I actually literally listen to his content over like, a Tony Robbins or someone. I mean, I, th I think we all need a success coach or, uh, you know, hypnotist, uh, hypnotist success coach in our life. And, you know, you could listen to Tony Robbins. You could listen to Ed Milet. You could listen to all these guys that, that we mentioned. Marcel's one of my best friends. I literally listened to his stuff to pump me up and to, and to help me like break through. I recently had a breakthrough listening to one of Marcel's pieces of content. And it was about it was about applying pressure to yourself, right? It, it was about, uh, you, you told the story of, 
when you lost your two dogs. They both died. And that moment, you were so motivated. You used the pain and the grief that you were feeling to, I think that night, you made like $40,000 $40, overnight. And that was yeah. before that was, that was ever even you know, remotely close to something that you could hit. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so for me, right, that was a huge breakthrough. I realized that one of my biggest moments of growth was when um, I had very little money left. I was basically broke and I applied to an apartment that was far out of my, my, uh, my financial comfort zone. And it, it was literally to the point where if I didn't pay, like I, if I couldn't make rent, then it would just be extremely socially embarrassing and I would have to leave the apartment. Um, and I didn't have a source of income at the time. I was coming out of a really dark part of my life. And what happened because I had to perform because I was forced to, because I, I, I manually applied pressure financially, I was able to break out. My question for you is aside from applying financial pressure, because actually I have a friend uh, that you know, I'm not going to mention his name, but he's very successful already. He's like a multimillionaire and he's invested in himself. You know, he's, he's spent a lot of money on coaching and courses, but yet he's still unmotivated. It's hard to push him with finances because the, the, the finances are, it's not a big deal for him. I have the answer. Okay. So my question is if finances are off the table, I'm saying like, you can't even tell him to put a million in to something. You yeah. can't use finances as a way to apply pressure so that there's urgency. How do you find something that, that, uh, that is going to push you to that next level that isn't money? It's never about money. It's about time. And that's what I was going to tell you from the beginning. Mm. The reason you had to make more money for rent is because there was a due date on the rent. It's not the money. The money was a side effect of valuing the time and knowing mm. that there was a deadline. If you value time and you understand that time is limited, money is not limited. Time is. If you understand that time is so limited that no matter what happens, you only have right now and maybe tomorrow, maybe the day after. I'm grateful for the fact that I woke up today. I'm grateful for the fact that I have right now. I'm alive right now. You never know. There's always a day that will come for every single one of us where we're going to die. And that's going to be the end of our time. If you know that you only have so much time and that time could be 100 years and it could be 30. Depends. Could even be less for others. And you want to make the most out of the time you have. There are things that I can control and there are things I can't. I can't control how much time I have. I can do my best to not put myself in situations. But for the most part, I'm going to do my best to become the best version of me in that amount of time. And if he truly was pursuing that version of him, rather than pursuing comfort or security, which is what he's, he's pursuing, he's pursuing comfort and security, rather than pursuing that potential, he'll have more urgency. But he doesn't value time. And if he valued time, he would not be so patient. So finances is a way to make you value time? So, no. Like, if you commit to something you can't afford, the the loss of your credit score, the loss of not having the ability to pay your rent and the stress that comes with not having a place to live or not paying your bills, not paying the car, ruining your reputation and, and understanding the, the negative effects of damaging your reputation in that way, that adds the pressure and the urgency because you have a right, deadline okay. to make the money. Yeah. It's all about a timeline. Mm -hmm. Can I do this before the timeline? The best relationship, for example, let's say you and Chloe just got in a fight. Chloe's his girlfriend at the time. At the, at the moment, she's your girlfriend, right? So <laughs> two years? Two years, yep. Okay, God forbid you and Chloe, let's say, are in the biggest fight ever. You even caught her cheating, let's say. She would never do it. She's not that type of girl. Let's mm -hmm. just say you caught her cheating. Mm -hmm. Worst case scenario. And there's an accident. And now she's on her deathbed. She got an hour left. Are you going to be like, why would you cheat? What are you going to think about in that moment? <laughs> You're saying she cheated and then she, she got cheated an accident? On, she cheated. Okay. And then now she's on her deathbed dying. Uh, I, I probably would forgive her. And how would you feel? Would you give her a bunch of love in that moment and tell her you love her and care about her? What yeah, as, as a human being, but in a different, very different way. It's, I don't think I would, uh, you caught her cheating. Yeah. Right now. An hour later, she's got an hour left. To live. How are you feeling? <laughs> I feel like karma's a bitch. Really? <laughs> no, no, no. I would, <laughs> oh I would, God. I would give her love and support. <laughs> oh I would give God. her love and support. I mean, I would. It, would, it wouldn't be the same as if Well, she, the reason I give you that example is because that's the worst case scenario that someone could do to you, right? Disloyalty. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, so the point is, is most people with that example would put it aside 
And yeah, it yeah, I would put it aside. I yeah. mean, it, I would obviously be like, why the fuck you do that? But I'd be like, yo, I, I, I'm grateful for everything we've shared. And, 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 you, know, and but, well, you know, you would try and make the most out of the moment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The gist is imagine someone doesn't do that and you have a couple minutes left with them. How would you treat them? Yeah, miraculous. I mean, like amazingly. Like, so yeah. now let's give you this perspective. You meeting someone for the first time. Let's say you met Chloe. If Chloe's going to be the mother of your kids, hypothetically, right? You never know. She might be. So if she's the mother of your kids, you go back to the first time you met her and you told her, hey, I'm on my deathbed. I have two minutes left to live. And I got to come back to this moment right here. What are we doing differently? How would you treat her differently? What would be different in the first time you met her? The first time I met her? Yeah. If I knew I was going to die in two minutes? If you were 85, she's 80, whatever. And then you get to go back in time to that moment and you got to do it all over again, how would you live that, that out? I would treat her the exact same. Okay, would she change it? Would she treat you different? No. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So a lot of the time, you'll fight with someone, and how long do you not talk to them for? Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you, you uh, hold it out. You hold it out. You have a grudge. Yeah. Your ego gets involved. You play games at the beginning for how long? Mm. Months. You just waste time. Well, I, I will say, I mean, to this is kind of like a slightly separate topic, but Chloe specifically, like there were one of the reasons I, I liked her was because there were zero games between either of us. What smells bad? Someone cooking something? My sense of smell is ridiculous. Anyways, yeah. And that's how it is with someone who values time, yeah. right? So most people don't value time, mm. so they don't make money. You value time. That's why you make money. Mm. That's the number one variable. Your friend that we're talking about. How do you life, make someone value time? You give them a deadline. You give them urgency. They're, what the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you, make, you, make it, you make it to where. Here's the point of me bringing this subject up. Nobody values time. I meet all these people. They're just like, I, I will stay this way forever. I will stay unhappy forever. <laughs> fuck you, bro. Like, you know, like it just pisses me off. I can't handle, in, I can't handle people who are so patient. I'm patient so unless I'll give you perspective. If patience is the fastest route, then I'll, I'll be patient. Sometimes you have to be patient. You got to be patient that you're going to get what you want. You might have to be patient in a negotiation. You might have to be patient when you're talking to somebody and you want to influence them, but that's also the fastest route. So it's not that I'm being patient. It looks like I'm being patient, but I'm actually taking the shortcut. I am all about shortcuts. So whatever the shortcut is, I'm going to take it. If, for example, you're in dating, you can't just be like, I'm in love with you, I'm going to marry you. No, the right and the fastest way to meet your right partner is to be extremely patient with everyone you meet mm. to make sure that they are the right partner. Because if I pick the wrong person, I waste three, four years with them. That's three, four years that I could have been meeting new people and eventually met someone. So I'm actually delaying that. I'm delaying my ability to find the right part, uh, person. I'm, if I'm hiring someone, I want to make sure I'm very, very patient with who I'm hiring. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a ton of inter interviews, but I'm patient with who I pick because I want to make sure that I pick the right person right away. Mm. So patience is a virtue if you're impatient. Mm. If you're doing a lot and you're, the goal of patience is to not waste your time, mm. the end justifies the patience. The ends justify the means. So the end result is that I am so patient in order to not waste my time. But if you're just patient to be patient, you're an idiot. You're wasting all your time. And... We are disassociated from time. People are like, oh, you know, let me just go party for a few years and then eventually be like this. What do you mean? If you're partying now, you're going to party in 10 years. You're still going to be a party person. You know how many women I know that are going barren right now? That are going what? Barren. Barren? Like they can't have kids? They're not going to have kids. They're, wow. They're, 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 they're passing a period and they drank so much that actually expedites that time period. Wow. They did a bunch of drugs that expedites that. Maybe even a decade. Mm. There's a statistic. It's gnarly. It just came out. You want to hear what it is? What is it? That if a woman hasn't had kids by the age of 30, there's a 50% chance that she will ever have kids. Mm. That is horrific. Yeah. The birth rate is so much lower than the death rate right now that our population is actually declining. Mm. Everyone's talking about population you know, control. Well, our population is actually dying. Mm. You know what the average amount of kids you'd have 100 years ago was? Six. You know what it is now? It's not even one. <laughs> yeah, it's like 0.9 or something like that. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. not even one. So, yeah. you know, people change. But you want to be exceptional? Value time. Mm. Value time with people. Like when I talk to you, I'm present. I'm here with you. 
I'm alert. I'm paying attention. I'm with my friends. I'm alert. Mm. When I'm at a seminar, I'm in the. Fu- I'm so in the moment. I actually get amnesia after the event. Mm. I can't remember the event. I forget everything. I remember their faces. I do not remember what I've said. Mm-hmm. I watch the film as if I'm watching the seminar for the first time. Mm-hmm. Because I'm so present. Mm. You know, it's very very. Yeah, different. you're you're uh, the part of your mind that is in control of memory is just shut off. It's just like. We don't need to think about what just happened two seconds ago. We're here for the moment. And I, if I think about it, I can remember, but it's it's not there. Like it's very hard to access yeah. that. Whereas normally my memory is photographic. You know. Mm. Um, wow, we've gone an hour and a half. That's pretty quick. Are there any questions on here that we had to? Yeah, yeah. Drop questions in the chat. Let's do like a little Q and A section. I, again, this is Marcel is not, not really surprised to me. You and I could cook for another yeah, eight hours, hours straight. <laughs> there's there's unlimited content. I think that's an interesting topic is like, how do you develop the skill set of public speaking? Not only public speaking, but speaking to a camera, speaking to a podcast, um, speaking to someone that you're attracted to without ever running out of things to say. Um, I, I think that, and I think that there's two levels of this. I think there's two, there's really two types of, of um, uh, it, yeah, there's two levels of never running out of things to say and allowing yourself to just speak forever. The first one is when you kind of develop it as a skill set and you're and you have a slight filter on and it's this is still incredibly useful this is the mode that I use most of the time. The second one is when the filter is completely off. Completely off. And I think that the funniest people that I've ever met in my life are the ones with the latter where they they just have zero filter whatsoever and I mean that's cliche to say but when you recognize it you you actually see that there, there are people that uh, that they can talk and they'll just say something that is so left field. You're just like, how do you even possibly come up with that? How do you have the balls to allow yourself to, to say, say that? that? Yeah, it's just so so unhinged. Yeah. It's it, funny. You know, I mean, I think that's the same thing when it comes to making more money or being resourceful. You have to have the balls to do it. You have yeah. to have the balls to ask for the money. You have to have the, the confidence to do it. Um, there's a few questions here. One, is your seminar being recorded? It is not. Uh, I have not deleted my Instagram account. Instagram has deleted my Instagram account. Uh, <laughs> um, Thanks, Zucky. Yeah. You guys down to let us call in real quick for live questions. Um, no. Uh, not. No offense. It's not you. It's just I, I just know that that's a uh, – yeah, no, not right now. Does your Telegram link work to join the call? I'm having trouble going through. Uh, it's not a call. It's in person. Click the link in the description and sign up how do you push through the fear of embarrassment when out in public you you just don't like i like it i like when people look at me because i'm judging them i'm like oh you're judging me yeah i'm judging you. i remember when i started my my youtube channel in in boston and i you know in la like holding up a camera and filming yourself especially nowadays is like everyone knows what you're doing um, everyone still thinks it's maybe a little bit weird, but in the back of their mind, they're like, oh, you know, they're filming a TikTok or something. When I started filming YouTube videos in 2016 in Boston, where, you know, people like barely even know what YouTube is. Like it was the weirdest, strangest thing that you could possibly do. I would penny board to class in college. And I had a, like a, a DJI, like a steady cam yeah. kind of thing. And I had the drone. I had my backpack and then I had a drone, like a DJI Phantom 3, the big bulky one. Now you can fit them in your pocket. But I had the old one. So I would I would penny board with a big like stable cam thing and a big camera on top of it. And I would penny board to class. And what I noticed in doing that, you know, day after day after day is the reaction of everyone around you when it comes to like how people perceive you is they look at you, they go, huh, that's a little weird. And then as to use your terminology, they go straight back into trance. And I just, I observed it, right? I was listening to a lot of like Eckhart Tolle back then. And and I was just like being present, like in, you know, waking up to the matrix and just seeing like, wow, that's quite literally like this person's asleep, this person's asleep, this person. And they, they wake up, they see you, you're kind of a light for a moment. And then they're back into trance and they do not think about you. Nope. What like they they think about you for maybe eight seconds and then they're back. Yeah, and you it, should go hijack these trances. I, I would go hijack these trances. I just go up to them <laughs> and I'd be like, 
hey, nice to meet you. <laughs> so funny. I forgot my contacts. Can you tell what time it is? And just go ahead and look at that and close your eyes now. Don't close your eyes and just sleep. <laughs> Wide awake if you're watching this. Wide awake. I'm sure someone went in on that. I yeah. guarantee you someone went in. Someone's going to comment that they went in. Um, anyways, so hopefully no one's driving. Yeah. No, no, no one's in. We're good. Wide awake. Wide awake. Um, Wide awake. <laughs> You're the only one who's changed my life and you will change everyone's life. But Mark Zuckerberg, don't be want to see you to change people's life. You don't want to see you to achieve his goals. That's why. Yeah, maybe. Or the, just the algorithm doesn't like me, but fuck Or it. he just, the algo knows that Marcel needs a day off Instagram to, to think about other stuff. That's true, except I've been dealing with it for eight hours. So, <laughs> so I've been thinking about it more, unfortunately. Uh, um, what else do we want? I think the last thing I want to bring up to all of you that are watching, because there's actually pretty pretty good amount of you that have been here for a while. Um, is this, you know, I want to give you a free gift before I would be able to give you this gift casually. And the way I would be able to give you guys this gift was through Instagram. Well, currently we don't even know what's up with Instagram. And a lot of you already came from Telegram. So I'm going to give you my Telegram channel link right now. I'm going to share it here. You're going to join. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that right now. Here we go. I'm dropping it in the chat. You're going to join us in about 30 minutes from now. I will drop a new hypnosis audio in there for free. So that's going to be the coolest thing. Um, oh, shit. I need to pin it. Here we go. All right. So I'm going to drop a new hypnosis audio in there for free. You're going to love it. It's all about making money. It's going to change your life. So join my Telegram channel right there. It's pinned at the top. You'll see it. Click it. Join the Telegram channel. And I'll give you guys a new hypnosis audio in there for free. So that'll be cool. Share this with your friends. Let them check it out. And on that note, I think we should probably uh, wrap up the live. If you haven't joined the seminar, last chance to shatter the glass maze and come cash in your winning lottery ticket. You have anything else you want to say, Arlen? Guys, go check out his YouTube channel, Arlen Moore, A-R-L-I-N space Moore, M-O-O-R-E. Just a fruity little travel hoe. Yeah, and you'll see he's That's a fucking all. G. So, guys, I'll see you there. Thank you for watching and you know i'll let you know if i launch a new instagram right now i'm a bit bitter about this so at the moment there is no new instagram join telegram we'll start using TikTok, uh twitter marcel klein if you haven't been on my twitter go check it out marcel klein we'll start using that and youtube will be my number one platform so we'll be a lot more active on youtube i will see you guys soon all right guys <laughs>